My uh, two colleagues, uh, Bonnie and Lynn. I don't see her. Yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure to work on this conference with them, and I would like to thank Gabrielle, that I don't see her, but I really would like to thank her for a wonderful work on the archive downstairs. If you didn't see it, or brown people, you have two weeks to see the archive. I would like to thank Traude and Keith at Cocot Center for a really uh, big help in making this happen. I would like to thank Amanda for having us here, and I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, until the very last moment, I was not decided if I'll just share or speak, but I couldn't resist. So, uh, uh, I'll present myself as a speaker. So, my name is Ariela Azulai. I am teaching at uh, Comparative Literature and Modern Culture and Media. Um, and I'll present the other speakers, and then I'll present uh, my uh, non-paper argument, and then we will move to the next speaker. So, uh, Mazna Katu is a junior research uh, fellow in history at King's College, Cambridge, and was previously Ibrahim Abulugud Fellow at the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia University. She is currently writing a history of Palestinian education in the first decade after the 48 war. She is the author of a socio-historical database and archive of Palestinian exile and refugee communities as part of the Civitas Research Collective at Nuffield College, Oxford, and has written on issues in histories of development, class, and popular mobilization amongst refugees, on the politics and practices of Palestinian archives, on solutionism and histories of recognition and refusal, and various aspects of comparative settler colonial studies. The third speaker would be Aiten Goodgo. She is an assistant professor of political science at Barnard College. Her research, cent uh, research uh, uh, centers on critical approaches on, uh, to human rights, contemporary problems of citizenship, and political and ethical di dilemmas of international migration. She is the author of Rightlessness in, uh, the, uh, in an Age of Rights by Oxford University Press 2015 and of articles in Law, Culture and the Humanities, Contemporary Political Theory and European Journal of Political Theory among other journals and anthologies. Uh, then Charles uh, Heller and Lorenzo Pisani that I'll present uh, uh, separately, but they are working collaboratively. So let me start with Charles Heller. He's a researcher and filmmaker whose work has a long-standing focus on the politics of migration. In 2015, uh, sorry, originally from Switzerland, in 2015 he completed a PhD in research architecture at Goldsmith University of London, where he continues to be affiliated as a research fellow. He is currently based in Cairo, conducting a postdoctoral research supported by the Swiss National Fund at the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies, American University, Cairo, and the Centre d'études et de documentation économique, uh, juridique et sociale in Cairo is part of the Precarious Trajectories documentary project based at Goldsmith. His writing has appeared in the journals Global Media and Communication and Philosophy and Photography. And Lorenzo uh, Pesani is an architect based between London and Northern Italy. His work deals with uh, spatial politics and visual culture of migration, with a particular focus on the geography of the ocean. He holds a PhD in research architecture and has uh, taught at Goldsmiths College and at the Bartlett School of Architect Architecture. His writing has appeared in the journals New Geographies and Harvard Design Magazine. Together, Charles and Lorenzo, since 2011, uh, they co-founded the Watch the Med and have been working on forensic ocean oceanogra oceanography. I don't know how to say it, sorry. Uh, ocean geography, oceanography. <laughs> a project that critically investigates uh, the militarized border regime and the politics of migration in the Mediterranean Sea. Their collaborative work has been published in several edited volumes, as well as in uh, the journal 
and the journals Cultural Studies, Postcolonial Studies, and in the Review, uh, Revue Européenne de Migration Internationale. Uh, so I'll start with my non-paper argument. And my non-paper argument uh, tries to bring into the conversation uh, what I think we can call a first wave of uh, forced migration, and I'm speaking about objects, uh, together with uh, slaves. They were, I think, part of the first uh, generation. And, uh, it is no secret that millions of objects that had never been destined for display in white cubes were looted from all over the world only to be carefully handled and preserved in Western museums as precious objects. Once looted, these objects were made inaccessible to the people who had created them and to the communities in which they had been produced, used, and exchanged. This breach between colonized people who were disp dispossessed of so many of their artifacts, cultural practices, and infrastructures, and the objects they made, which museums, archives, and libraries now handle according to imperial principal and procedures of classification and a discourse of salvation and preservation, is one of the founding principles of imperialism, which has never been abolished. Under imperial temporality and speciality, this breach is not conceived as an open debt that Europe owes to colonized people whose cultures were destroyed in the process of rescuing rare samples of these cultures to enrich European and American institutions. The process of formal decolonization provided the impetus to consolidate looting by transforming stolen objects into legally owned treasures, exonerating imperial powers of their debts, and withdrawing their responsibility to restore infrastructures and recover cultural practices that were devastated through colonial brutality while being construed as belonging to a less advanced stage of history. As long as an imperial temporality and speciality remains intact, people who are running away from political regimes in ex-colonies and seeking asylum in Europe are not perceived as connected to the precious, precious objects of their cultures that were illegally brought to the West and long ago converted into legal possessions. Restitution claims for discrete objects poorly addressed for years are not enough to overcome the imperial temporality and speciality that keep people in unbridgeable uh, unbridgeable distance from their culture as it is showcased elsewhere. The artifacts preserved in European American museums are not just exemplary masterpieces, but they are also mummies of imperial violence that should be transformed. European citizens acting against their governments to smuggle in refugees and assist them are effectively arguing that these refugees represent a pristine opportunity for European citizens to transform the legacy of imperial violence into a different contract between descendants of colonized and descendants of colonizers. Art objects so dearly preserved and appreciated by many can be the first ambassadors of a different ground for the emergence of shared rights or rights in common. The right of access or proximity to the artifacts of one's own culture, the right to live where one's culture was muse museified, uh, the right to have rights to one's objects, only by introducing such rights can phenomena like the hiring of refugees as guides in museums, as you can see here in this uh, screenshot that I took of refugees working in uh, the Pergamon Museum in uh, uh, Berlin. Only by introducing such rights can phenomena like the hiring of refugees as guides in museums that archive and present artifacts plundered from their homelands be not just another way to exploit people, but a way to excavate the wound, uh, quote, quote, Saidi Artaman, to ex excavate the wound of imperial crimes and respond to the plea of people who, in the one world created by 
sorry, to, uh, to the plea of people who in the one world created by imperialism have the right to a place within living communities created with and around shared objects and not in their outskirts. Thank you, and uh, after me, I think that it is, uh, yeah, come, uh, uh, Mesna Kachu. Mazna Kachu. Thank you. Um, so I want to reiterate and thank everyone who invited and coordinated and conceptualized and dreamed of this um, conference, workshop, symposium. And um, it's been especially fun as a historian to start thinking of objects a little differently and be able to kind of bring a material to bear in ways in which I'm not as familiar with. Um, um, so that, it, that, that also kind of excavating from myself on my own kind of forms of knowledge production, a way of thinking, has been really productive and fruitful before I even arrived. Um, so the objects that I'm going to bring to bear today are a film and a, and a, and a book booklet. And they serve to bring forward some of the themes of my broader work on refugee schooling, um, especially question, in particular, the question of permanence and the question of futurity. And here I want to think about them from the standpoint of the, the crisis appeals, i.e. The, the sort of outward, you know, the, the sort of appeals that are made in, in the US, in Europe, and in, in my conditions in the UK around how to support and uh, solve this um, humanitarian crisis. So the two objects are, First, a film that was done in 1950 by the Council for Relief of Palestine Arab Refugees, which was a kind of, uh, I don't know what the word, is, like consortium of various refu refugee relief agencies that had emerged in support of Palestinian refugees. And it was, and it comes back to Tom's talk about the Ad Council, because this is an example of a failed campaign. So they created this advertisement to be distributed in, you know, at the beginning of films and cinemas around the U.S. No film distribution company accepted to screen it. So Quakers started um, screening them in meeting houses. Um, the aim was to, I think the, the, the budgetary aim was uh, a few million. They raised um, the, the figures are kind of vague, but about $8,000 in total from this film. One of the important things also about this film is that it's introduced by Dorothy Thompson, the anti-fascist journalist, who as a result of her introduction to this film, she, it was the kind of straw that broke the camel's back in terms of her public respectability after a storied career as a journalist during the Second World War, and she was essentially blacklisted as a result of her participation in this film. So to honor her, I will screen a little bit of her introduction. The, the, it's a bit, um, the sound is a little blurry. So if, if it's on YouTube, and I will talk a little bit about that. But it's, um, the sound is, I'd have to apologize for the sound. Okay. Hello, because I have recently returned from visiting the scene of the picture you are about to see. Of course, the impression left on my mind by these wretched casualties of political change is much more distressing than the film. For no film can convey the icy winds from Mount Hermon as they blow upon crazy, flawless tents in Syria, or the rains that turn dwellings into mud holes in the rainy season in Lebanon, nor the defeated feeling even of those who are trying to help. But this film tells part of the story that until now has hardly been told at all outside the Arab world. We'll stop there, but I, so I wanted to go to this section, which is about the schools in the camp. If this is, by 1950, you saw the beginnings of the institutionalization of education for refugees. The previous, oh, I'm sorry. So by 1950, you saw the beginnings of the institutionalization of refugee education. You saw the first beginnings of a kind of bureaucracy around pedagogy. So this is a kind of artifact of, or a kind of visualization of what that looked like.
The children sense a depressing uncertainty as to their future. No one seems to have the answer to the eternal question, why do we have to stay here? Without a home, family life, toys, they have nothing to relieve their boredom except school. Education of these children is one of the most important aspects of the Arab refugee problem. The donation of just a blackboard meant a new class could be started under a tent in the open air when desert temperatures permit. The old proverb, idleness is the devil's pillow, holds good in a refugee camp more than anywhere else. They must be helped now to become useful citizens of tomorrow. It's not enough to train their minds. What will be in store for them when they grow past school age? Are they too to be doomed to a continuing life of uncertainty and lack of hope, such as is now the lot of their parents? The plight of these little girls is a challenge. Each is entitled to a seat in a classroom, to have a textbook and a share of a teacher's time and guidance. For many months there were no schools. Now there are only a few enough to accommodate about one-tenth of them or 45,000 children. And when school is out, the same reaction occurs all over the world, hubbub and wonderful excitement. But let's not forget, these are their homes. Sprawling. I, I, I will leave it at that dramatic end. Um, and the second object, which, because uh, I'm a fan of materiality and we couldn't kind of place it in the tent, is a booklet that was written by uh, a kind of a, a former Chicago journalist named Robert Faherty, who is also an amateur detective and romance novelist, who gets hired to travel through schools around um, the region um, and to report on them and the success of the UNRWA UNESCO program, which by 1959 had been around nine years in development. Um, so in a sense, what I'm seeing, you're seeing is the beginning of the 1950s and the end. And this is important because in 1959-1960, you had the world, uh, the year, the world, the year of the, the world year of the refugee, where you had mass appeals around the world around the question of refugees and support for them. So this was the, the Palestinian, Palestine contribution to those mass appeals. So I'm going to um, send this around. So I'm not going, I mean, I'm not going to talk too long because I hope the conversation will bring out some things. But um, what I think that looking at these appeals and looking at them through the prism of education offers is this fundamental question around permanence and futurity in, in, in these ways. What is to be done with the sacredness of strangers when the hospitality to newcomers is replaced by, by the unease of a guest who has overstayed their welcome? So in this film, you see refugee support by Egyptians, by a Lebanese priest who distributes homilies and candy, but also further away, this idea of the duty of humanity towards supporting and um, bringing to refugees what FDR in 1951, 41 called the, the four freedoms. Freedom of fear, want, uh, a couple other things. <laughs> fear, want, speech, and worship. So in these themes that we see in um, nine or 10 years apart, they, they, they bring out the question of how time heightens fear, time heightens anxiety, and it heightens this un un sense that order must be restored at any cost, and that order must be cordoned into a trajectory, whatever that might be. Um, in, in, I think you heard it in this where it says, idleness is the devil's playground for these children. Time is the state's playground. So in terms of futurity, what this means is that by night, by, with education, by 1954, relief, emergency relief, turns to a rapid expansion of resettlement as a solution to these refugees. This is despite and against refugee desires that are vociferously expressed, and yet at the same time a contradictory idea of education being a form of social capital that the refugee desires in order to 
be able to migrate out in, and form some kind of social, um, some kind of mobility outside the camp. Um, so what does this um, also tell us? That there's often in, this, in, this, in the descriptions on Palestine in particular of the 1950s, there's a binary between an international order that imposes a certain kind of disciplinary process through education versus a refugee imagination of return. This binary, I argue, elides the ways in which refugees themselves maneuver through the infrastructure and terrain of these orders. Education is a good example of this. How classrooms and refugee camps become sites not just as spaces of discipline, but also of subversion. The schools become sites of surveillance by the state, but also of mobilization, of secret societies, of underground clubs. In, Moten, in Fred Moten's terms, they become in undercommons. So the refugee futurism that is foreclosed by the international order is perhaps one of return, but it's also the return to a future. It's a future in which uh, the state no, lang no longer can cordon off uh, populations, no longer can discipline them in ways that make them um, desirable. There's a kind of criminality in the classroom that I try to resuscitate that is against these kinds of, um, that is kind of alluded to in the ways in which these appeals project the threat of, um, the threat that these, uh, that not caring for or not supporting these students might bring out. Um, so in this sense, the stakes for the camps as time progresses um, become larger than just humanitarian care. They become larger than, than uh, a sense of an emergency crisis. They become larger than a question of humanitarianism or their humanness. They become a question of the very possibility of a world that, might, that, that the refugees themselves aim to conjure and that the world order has decided they must not. Thank you. Hi, I would like to also uh, start by thanking the organizers and those who helped organize uh, this um, wonderful workshop, uh, especially Ariella, Bonnie, and Gabriella. Um, I thought of this uh, as a seven, eight minute presentation, and then I realized that as I was trying to make it shorter and shorter, uh, it became very cryptic and cryptic. <laughs> so I want to start very briefly about how this interest in this particular object uh, came into being in the first place. Um, it's, uh, I'm currently working on um, a project on the notion of the human person, especially how this notion appears in uh, several human rights documents and how it gets to be represented in different ways. Uh, including the assumption that these two terms have now become conjoined so much so that they are interchangeable, the human as the person and the person as the human. I'm interested in those cases where there is actually no overlap or where we see failures of recognizing the human being as the person or the, as the rights-bearing uh, subject. And that came into being from my research on my book, Rightlessness in an Age of Rights. As I was doing the work on that book, I came across a 2012 case from the European Court of Human Rights. Um, the case is uh, called Hirsi Jamavi, Italy. It's about basically the Somali and Eritrean migrants who were intercepted uh, on, honestly by uh, Italian um, officials and then given to uh, Libyan officials who returned them back to Libya. Uh, and the court ruled that uh, this was a violation of the right to be uh, free from collective expulsion. Um, but, and it was celebrated, the uh, case was celebrated by many human rights organizations as a case that actually showed that human rights now have an extraterritorial reach. But what was interesting, and I can talk about the case more, but there were these two migrants uh, who were included as applicants um, in the case, um, but they were dead by the time of the trial, by the time of the case. And um, uh, they had their signatures as applicants, um, but the court decided that their um, 
demands were identical to the rest of the applicants, and since they are now dead, they don't actually have legal standing. So they were not recognized as persons. And those are the kinds of issues that I'm now working on, which actually lead me to um, questions of personhood in cases of migrant deaths. How do we think about personhood in uh, situations of migrant deaths? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, and the object I chose is related to that. Border policies have made the journeys of migrants increasingly perilous, resulting in thousands of deaths each year. These deaths are oftentimes recorded as statistical estimates by international organizations. According to the International Organization of Migration, for example, there have been approximately 40,000 fatalities since 2000. But these efforts to create a sense of outrage by the sheer magnitude of numbers leave much to be said about these deaths. So do the frequent news stories about migrant boat tragedies, which are often accompanied by photos of overcrowded or capsized boats, search and rescue teams, and dead bodies on the shore. And it was, and it was these images, perhaps not unlike the ones that you see on the slide, I hope you're seeing it on the slide, I see something completely different here, that gave rise to contemporary artist Nikolai Larsen's multimedia installation, End of Dreams. As Larsen puts it, and I'm quoting him, I saw a press photo where many dead bodies wrapped in cotton sheets were lying in long rows next to each other, and I want to recreate that photo. I'd like to focus on Larsen's work today to talk about accidents, especially accidents that may turn out to be crimes, as well as the accidents that go into the making and unmaking of the human person. But before I do that, I want to say a few words about the image I chose and Larsen's End of Dreams. Larsen's project initially started in 2014 when he prepared 48 sculptures using wire, armature, and concrete canvas, which is a fabric embedded with a specially formulated concrete that hardens when exposed to water, and it's used especially in the building of shelters in disaster zones. These sculptures, evoking the now familiar images of dead migrants wrapped in fabric or placed in body bags, were then installed under a raft and submerged in the sea of the coast of Pizzo Calabro in South Italy. The plan was to let them develop a patina of water organisms and to exhibit them as a sculptural, sculptural constellation manifesting the wear and tear of the sea. However, a violent storm destroyed the raft, scattering the sculptures across the seabed and onto the nearby beaches. Many of the sculptures disappeared altogether. On that very same night of the storm, a migrant boat capsized in the Sicilian Strait. The storm, along with the news of the capsized boat, led to a re-envisioning re of the project. Larsen hired di divers to locate the scattered sculptures and to film them. What results from this effort is a multimedia installation comprising a five-channel video shot under sea and a composition of some of the sculptural remains. The photograph I chose for this workshop is from a series of, um, this is the multimedia installation, um, and this is the photograph I chose. The photograph I chose for this workshop is from a series of portraits that Larson prepared to document the marks and cuts inflicted on sculptures by the forceful crash. I also found a very short video to maybe uh, introduce the multimedia installation. Um, so I'm going to get out of this quickly and try to show you a brief clip showing, introducing the installation stuff, but now I think I completely lost it. Okay.
The key term I would like to look into today is accident, in two senses of the term, which can mean both an unfortunate incident and in, an inessential attribute. Let me start with the first and the more obvious meaning, which is now the most common one. Accident is an unfortunate event that is unexpected and unintentional, resulting in damage or injury. This is the meaning that is at work in Larson's description of the collapse of the sculptures caused by the storm. And it is again this meaning that we see in the description of the capsized boats as accidents. And one of my propositions is that Larson's end of dreams can give rise to a questioning of that description, perhaps gesturing to the possibility that what is cast as accident turns out to be a crime. To move in this direction, let me briefly introduce a point made by Walter Benjamin in his 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Benjamin highlights the crucial transformation that photography undergoes once its focal point shifts from the portrait to the streets exemplified for him by the photographs of deserted Paris that Eugène Adjaye took around 1900. I'm going to show some examples of those, two examples of uh, Adjaye's photography. And I'm quoting Benjamin here. It has quite justly been said of him that he photographed them like scenes of crime. The scene of a crime too is deserted. It is photographed for the purpose of establishing evidence with Adjaye photographs become standard evidence for historical occurrences and acquire a hidden political significance." Unquote. My goal here is not to draw an exact parallel between Age and Larson's work, but instead to think about how visual media can be used to set up a crime scene. I'd like to take what Benjamin says about photography as a starting point to think about Larson's end of dreams as a multimedia installation. Now I'm going to hopefully go to the image of the installation. The concrete canvas sculptures, which strike us with their marks and cuts in, in, in the individual portraits, are arranged here in a way not unlike bodies in a crime scene. In some respects, each one turns into a corpus delicti, or the body of a crime, figuratively serving evidence of an injury resulting from border policies that push migrants to even more dangerous routes. But these canvas sculptures also have an eerie quality. If they are supposed to resemble coffins or body bags containing the dead bodies of migrants, it's also important to note that they are empty. There is nothing inside the wire armature. And as Thomas Lacour puts it in his book, The Work of the Dead, a purposely empty tomb, a cenotaph, or an empty coffin have power precisely because they lack what is universally expected. I want to suggest that what is gone missing, along with corpus or the body, is also the person, which is often understood metaphysically as an intrinsic quality of human beings, which allows them to stand as rights and duty-bearing subjects. This is an idea that has its origins in Christianity, especially the debates on Trinity, which gave rise to the notion of person as an individual, intransmissible, or incommunicable rational essence that is inherent in the human being. Even the secularized understandings of the person continue to take it as an essential attribute of human beings, one grounded there in their reason, sanctity, dignity, etc. But Larson's portraits of these canvas sculptures resembling coffins challenge such metaphysics of the person. In their uncanny emptiness, they perhaps suggest that personhood is not an essential substance to be located within the human, but instead an artificial and accidental attribute an assembled effect of legal, political, narrative, and visual practices, and aside from those, there was nothing but a hollow armature. Here we encounter the second meaning of accident, which is much older but has become somewhat obscure. This meaning goes back to Aristotle, his notion of sumbebekos, which denotes a property or quality not essential to a substance or object. Accidents restaged as crimes bring out the accidental nature of personhood, that which was thought to be substantial, essential, intrinsic, turns, turns out to be accidental. Larson's portraits evoke this possibility, I think, by moving away from the conventional focal point of portrait photography, which is human countenance. To go back to Benjamin, photography, a medium he closely associates with the loss of the aura of the artwork, 
still held on to some kind of cult value of the image in its early stages. To quote Benjamin, it's no accident that the portrait was the focal point of early photography. The cult of remembrance of loved ones, absent or dead, offers a last refuge for the cult value of the picture. For the last time, the aura emanates from the early photographs in the fleeting expression of the human face. Portraits of human face continue to occupy a central place in the human rights photography, including those that center on migration and displacement. By shifting away from the human countenance that has often been the bearer of an aura, Larson's portrait series of canvas sculptures hint at, at, at a desacralized understanding of the human person, one that breaks with the idea that the human person is that which carries its inherent dignity within. There is perhaps still the suggestion of an irreplaceable distinctiveness if we attend to the marks and cuts imprinted by the storm, and some of the sculptures have also acquired water organisms during their lifetime in the seabed, but a distinctiveness that is not intrinsic or inherent, instead accumulated and assembled over time, layer upon layer, and once one removes those layers, there is nothing but hollowness. So um, I certainly also want to extend a thanks to, uh, to the organizer and just say um, how pleased I am that, uh, to be here with, with all friends, but also to discover new uh, exciting work. So thanks, Gabriel, uh, Ariella and Gabriel. Um, so the material, is it working? So the material that we're going to present today um, comes from a collaborative work, as Ariella was saying, that, that Charles and me started in 2011 um, as a response somehow to the dramatic events that were unfolding in the Mediterranean in those months uh, when several hundreds of Tunisians and, and, and people coming from Libya uh, were dying at sea uh, um, what, with what at the time were record numbers of, of deaths. Um, so we started this project called Forensic Oceanography, uh, which has since attempted to critically investigate the Mediterranean uh, space as a border regime uh, and understand somehow and analyze the spatial and aesthetic conditions that have led to these many deaths uh, that have been also invoked in the, in the previous presentation. Um, if, as we will try to show, um, the very act of exclusion that underpins uh, the European Union's politics of migration takes place as well within and through its various visualizations. We argue that struggling for the right of migrants uh, then also means claiming a right to look that would be able to challenge the borders uh, of what can be seen and heard. Um, however, we also argue that these borders are not uh, clearly demarcated, they are porous and ambivalent, and, though, uh, and, and thus demand careful uh, and tactical positioning. So to unfold this, this argument, uh, we would like to share with you a few images uh, that come from our archive and that um, images in, in a kind of extended sense of the term, uh, objects ranging from photographs to, to satellite imagery, and offer a kind of forensics operating not only through, but also off uh, these very images themselves. I mean, uh, and what I mean by that is the tracing uh, of their production and circulation and the way they've come to be embedded within the violence they document, or on the contrary, uh, they seek to contest. A year ago or so, I uh, made a little experiment and uh, inserted the words immigrant, boat, Mediterranean into the Google uh, search engine. The search produced tens of thousands of similar um, images, which I believe you see um, on the screen. Many of these images have circulated for years, drifting from article to article losing any remnant of photography's uh, indexicality. This is the case, for example, in uh, the case of this particular image, which I clicked on and since it seemed to epitomize uh, the migrant's boat somehow, right? 
um, that particular images was here connected to um, a Guardian article uh, dated 29th of March 2012. As I clicked on the article, I found that it was captioned with the elusive, many migrants and refugees risk their lives to cross the Mediterranean from Africa to Europe. As the elusive caption should suffice to indicate, um, this image no longer referred to any specific event, but had become kind of generic uh, image pointing to the structural event of the violation of Euro Europe's borders um, by overcrowded um, boats. The image, in fact, um, had been taken in September 2008 by the French military when they uh, intercepted um, this vessel. This image continues to be used today uh, referring to Syrian migrants crossing the sea, um, for example. So this image um, has become a floating image in the terms of Ito Steyerl, unmoored, anonymous, perpetually dispersed. It echoes the condition of the subject it depicts. The constant appearance of this and similar images of intercepted slash rescued boats in the mainstream media participate in the production and reproduction of the border spectacle, which Nicolas de Genova has uh, incisively analyzed. Through these images, the threat of illegalized migration and the securitization work of border control are simultaneously made visible and naturalized. And, and this in a circular way. If migrants are being intercepted, it is because they are a threat. If they are a threat, then um, militarized means of policing must be deployed to um, neutralize this threat. The circulation of these images thus plays a crucial role in produ producing the sense of crisis and enabling, in turn, ex exceptional responses um, to it. However, when images uh, documenting the structural violations that are the product of the migration regime are produced, the latter are rather kept in the shadows. This was the case in what came to be known as the left to die boat case, which we have um, investigated, in which at the height of the 2011 NATO-led military intervention against Libya, 72 migrants fleeing Libya were left to drift in the central Mediterranean for 15 days. Despite the stress signals sent out to all vessels navigating in this area and several encounters with military aircrafts and warships, the reluctance of all actors to rescue the drifting passengers led to the slow death of 63 people. During these 15 days, several photographs uh, were taken, only one of which um, we have actually had access to. This is the image you see here, which is the, um, the first photograph and the first detection by an external actor of the migrant's vessel. Here, the photograph was taken by a French surveillance aircraft, which sent this photograph and the position of the migrant's boat um, to the um, Maritime Rescue and Coordination Center um, in Rome. But there were several other images which we have never accessed and which have continued somehow to haunt our investigation. One particular image um, or series of images, rather, um, was produced at the moment when the migrant's vessel drifted near a large military ship after almost 10 days of drift, when half of the passengers had already um, died. Dan Haile Gebre, whom you see here uh, during our interview, recalled this encounter as follows. We are watching them, they are watching us. We are showing them the dead bodies, children. We drank water from the sea, we cried. The people on the boat took pictures, nothing else. The conjunction between this act, 
this act of deadly non-assistance and photography seems to recall Susan Zunstag's argument that photographing, which seeks to keep things as they are for at least as, it, as long as it takes to take a good picture, is fundamentally an act of non-intervention, which is complicit with the forms of human suffering it documents. And yet this, doc this argument cannot describe all acts of photographing, starting by that of the migrants themselves who were um, embarked on this drifting um, boat, who recounted to us that they themselves were photographing with their mobile phones the successive uh, events during these 15 days. The encounter between these two boats then, one belonging to the most powerful actors on earth, the other to the world's undesirables, was also then an encounter between photographers with each photographing each other. So the images um, that had been produced by both parties in this encounter um, have remained eaten to this day, except the one that, that Charles was, uh, was showed just a, just a minute ago. They still exist, probably stored on, on a flashcard or, or on a computer hard drive, and yet they remain inaccessible to our investigation as well as to you know, many other investigations that have been done on this case. So in the absence of these incriminating photographs and of external witnesses, our investigation on the Left to Die boat case attempted to reconstruct a, a kind of composite image of the events by piecing together several other fragments of information scattered across a vast assemblage of human and non-human feeds. We mobilized, I guess, a grain, the vast apparatus of remote sensing devices optical and thermal cameras, radars, tracking devices, and satellite imaging technologies, which have transformed the contemporary ocean into a vast and technologically mediated sensorium. While these technologies are often used for the purpose of policing illegalized migration, they have been used here uh, to reconstruct and map with precision what happened to this vessel. This uh, synthetic aperture radar image taken on the 29th of March 2011, i.e. during the drift of the boat, by the European State Agency's uh, Ambisat satellite is a good example of that. When combined uh, with a drift model, uh, you can go to the next as well, uh, that maps the trajectory of the migrant's boat after they ran out of fuel, uh, and indicates that the boat's location at the time of the picture was the, the yellow hatches that you see uh, in the image here. Um, it allowed us to determine that the bright pixel appearing across the surface of the image represent large ships that were located in the vicinity of the migrant's boat and could have easily rescued them, but chose not to intervene. And if you go to the previous one, in fact, sorry. You, you see here a zoom in on the, and, and you see these bright pixels uh, that, that represent these military ships. At the same time, though, uh, this image does not show any other, of any other migrants' boats that are possibly to be found within its frame as they remain below the thresholds of detectability due to their small size and the low resolution of the image. So what we try to do, instead of replicating the technological eye of policing and its untenable promise of full-spectrum visibility, uh, what we tried to do, I was saying, was exercising what we called a disobedient gaze, redirecting the light shed by the surveillance apparatus away from illegalized migration and back towards the act of policing itself. Um, so through these and many other techniques, we were able to reconstruct and map, as I was saying, uh, what happened to this vessel across the complex uh, and fragmented geography of the ocean, uh, as you can see in, the, in this map here. However, it would be probably too simplistic to see a simple binary between the state-produced spectacle of border transgression and policing and the hidden violence of the border that is to remain hidden in the shadows. Large-scale large shipwrecks are becoming less and less the unavowable supplement of the border regime, and rather, to a certain extent at least, what drives and justifies it. Uh, every tragedy, um, 
and in the sense, of course, we share the kind of you know uh, unpacking of, of the term accident that, that, that you were doing just a minute ago, uh, is now granted extraordinary media attention and usually followed by urgent calls from EU politicians for more surveillance, more control, and more militarizations, a precisely some of the mechanism that we would argue have caused death in the first place. This became apparent in the aftermath of the 3rd of October shipwreck of Lampedusa, um, maybe go back one, uh, when the anger of the Lampedusa airport was transformed into something in between an improvised media center uh, and a mortuary. Um, in the official speeches that followed that event, the very policies of border control that forecloses any possibility of legal access to the EU and forces hundreds of people onto rickety boats vanished from view and, and any critical analysis, and states in that occasion have instead pledged to combat the death of migrants at sea by increasing the budget of Frontex, the EU uh, agency that, that controls uh, the external borders of the Union, and going after the Inus smugglers or, or even called traffickers that are now labeled uh, as the slave traders of the 21st century, i.e. somehow like making confusion between cause and effect and not recognizing that the fact that smugglers exist only insofar as people are not granted legal access. So paradoxically, uh, in the context of what William Walters has called the humanitarian border, it is precisely the spectacular visibilization of death uh, that has fueled the deployment of the exceptional military, humanitarian, and political solutions uh, that have defined the current crisis and contribute to, continu to the continuation of deaths of migrants at sea on a large scale. So this is a setting regime uh, and I'm going to conclude here, imposed by borders in the Mediterranean, thus cannot be captured by any simple binary. At work, uh, I would say, is a complex and conflictual field where visibility and invisibility do not designate two discrete and autonomous realms, but rather a topological continuum within which any practice that seeks to context the deadly border regime must position itself carefully. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for wonderful presentations, and uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Yes, Fran. Uh, thank you all for these wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, I think most of us are struck by the commonality of this idea of reproduction, um, even uh, kind of the reproduction of disciplinary power in the schools, I think. Uh, and I want to actually, uh, direct this question more to Ariella, but also break it back to everybody. Of thinking of reproduction in, in, in your, what you just mentioned to us about museums and items, um, I was just struck by this project that, ha I'm sure you're probably aware of this, but there's this project that hap uh, happened recently, the other Nefertiti, um, where two German artists uh, went into um, the museum in Berlin that houses the Nefertiti statue, right? This very contested object, right? This very contested treasure. And they brought in this really high resolution 3D scanner to it and, and they scanned this, right? The museum quality scanner. And up do, up do, uh, uploaded the code to torrent websites where people can actually use 3D printers to print out uh, the Nefertiti statue. And people have actually put the reproduction of the statue in museums in Egypt, right, as a, as a sign of protest. So, um, and you can think of this, uh, to tie it in again, um, you know, this, these printed statues as poor images, right? There's a power in there, the fact that they're not perfect reproductions and, and tying this back to Benjamin and, and notions of the aura and how we think of the art, not necessarily, um, saying that perhaps with new technology we'll have a different relation to the art in, in, in these museums, but perhaps it highlights different values, right, that can arise or live together. Um, so um, I'm just wondering perhaps, Ariel, if you could say a little more, um, or um, I could point you to the fact what you can see piracy um, and its relation or complication of ideas of law legality, which are again tied to the state. I'd be very interested in your thoughts of how reproduction, um, or, or imperfect reproduction could fit in to what you brought to us. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. I remember a few years ago I, been, I was in Berlin and I went to see the Pergamon Museum and I saw uh, Nefertiti, but before I saw Nefertiti I saw, you know, uh, billboards all around the city, the most fashionable Berlin woman, uh, which is of course uh, part of the reproduction. I think that this uh, procedure of uh, uh, entering uh, or using illegally uh, these kind of high resolution scanners in the museum it should be reformulated as not an illegal act but as a claim to share the millions of objects that are all around the world. And uh, in the last couple of years there was a, uh, I think very uh, problematic focus on uh, claims of restitution of discrete objects rather than speaking about the, uh, the, uh, the regime or rather than speaking about more uh, 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 general claims about looting and how we can redistribute wealth that is related to art objects. Uh, and I think that this action of, uh, the, the, even the, the fact that they cannot scan this object is uh, symptomatic of the way that museum rejects these kind of discrete uh, claims to restitute objects. Nefertiti is a, a very uh, symbolic object. Uh, and I think that, you know, after years that these kind of uh, claims were uh, rejected, I think that at the end it's maybe not bad because these objects stayed in the West and now I think when the media create the uh, 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 migration of refugees as a crisis, it's an opportunity uh, to mobilize on the uh, uh, participation of citizens in some European countries to uh, address their, to act against their governments and to endorse these kind of illegal acts and to make them as part of a citizenship act. So rather than speaking about this as illegal act, this I think the way to redefine citizenship that is against nation state and uh, to give refugees priority as the first uh, uh, legal citizens in this uh, newly imagined citizenry that is based around objects that are already in the West and people have claimed to them and they can be there and not just being uh, 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 have to be satisfied with the return of one or two Nefertiti. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the fascinating panel. Uh, my question is to Mesna. So this is just a historical question. I'm, I'm very um, interested, uh, very curious about the chapter that you're talking about and describing to us, so I want to invite you to expand a little bit. The three kind of accepted solutions in the post war refugee law world, especially after 1951, are return, integration, or, or resettlement. And return is considered, theoretically at least, to be the preferred one, uh, and uh, resettlement is considered to be a kind of last resort, if you will. So, as I understand you, you're, maybe that's not the latter, maybe, you know, it's arguable, but I understand you to be saying that the, UNH, the, the, the UNRWA actors in the refugee camps were actually kind of using education in a way that would facilitate resettlement and that the pe people in the refugee camps were largely rejecting that and were finding ways to use education in order to um, generate this uh, futurity of return. So first, uh, is that a fair account of what you're saying? And then um, I'm wondering if integration was at all um, an option on the table at that time, who are the actors that we're pushing for or against it, and also um, to ask about this resettlement idea, I, I'm, you know, I'm not familiar with this, but who are, uh, were, they, were there countries on board that were actually going to re resettle Palestinian refugees, and was there a kind of concrete UN plan for resettlement that was, um, you know, that this education system was part of as an instrument? Um, yeah, that's a lot. So I, I, I'll try um, to be a little concise. So the, the, yes, those are certainly the three kind of um, options placed in front of refugees. For the educational system began um, really as an autonomous project of the refugees themselves. The idea was, okay, all these kids are running around, let's you know, collect them, put them under one tent, an old milit British military barrack tent, and we'll do the ABCs, Quran, and 
whatever it is. By, oh, sorry. This became the, the project of education quickly transformed into a question of containment, um, particularly an anxiety of the Jordanian state, which insisted, as all Arab regimes insisted, that all Palestinian refugees must um, study the curriculum of their country. So essentially what happened was Palestinians were being told to teach other Palestinians to be Jordanian. That is integration. That is what the integration process looked like. What you do in those circumstances as a teacher and a student is what I'm interested in. What you do in the classroom, what you do around the classroom. Because what happens is, is very often the language around this is, well, they rejected it, there was resistance, there was survival. No, they went through education, around education, under education. But education was something that was kind of seen as a site for these kind um, you, the politics and the refusal of the political in, in, in simultaneously. Um, so that goes as well to this question of return. So Palestinian refugees were debating intensely during this period about what the stakes were for education. So on the one hand, education provided a retrieval of a certain kind of social capital that is mobile that was lost as a result of dispossession. Um, and this meant, for example, that you could be educated in a particular kind of skill that would allow you to find a job in the Gulf that was growing in terms of uh, development. Um, but simultaneously, there was this understanding that education meant that you were further away from the promise of return. You were leaving the frontier. You were leaving the longest border with the enemy state, as it were. Um, and these kinds of tensions maintain themselves all throughout. Um, and, and, and this is why, I mean, this is, there's an interesting way in which the 1950s is often regarded as this period of outward migration of Palestinians, and also a kind of, this, the 50s is a moment of waiting, a prehistory to the revolution, um, and, and what I'm trying to retrieve is actually what, what it means to, the, to unpack that and think about how the deliberations around broader political questions were being embodied in very spaces that became, um, you know, that consolidated in the 1950s, namely education. And that goes to this question of return. So what you had in this period as well is that there's a transformation throughout the decade from a demand for return, because we just left last week, right, to uh, uh, an anxiety around permanence. So when you're in a tent, a burlap tent, for four winters, a problem starts to, an infrastructural material fleshness of being a refugee for four years starts to, you know, compound. Um, and that is when you see, kind of in 1954, 55, a beginning of a real deliberation around, okay, we should start building mud, brick dwellings, the Zinco roof starts coming up. So the, that, that is the kind of deliberation around return that emerges. Um, in terms of UN policy, absolutely. So there was, what I found through archival work is that UNRWA in particular was absolutely adamant about resettlement, whereas UNESCO was not. UNESCO was, all, so you'll see in the documentation that UNESCO constantly talks about rights, UNRWA does not. UNRWA had a strong relationship with Gulf states, and Gulf states more or less would send requests for certain kind of training based upon the Gulf economy. So you had a rise in for, um, you know, um, sort of oil refinery kind of skill training, carpentry, and the most important was teacher training colleges. So in, you know, several refugee camps start having these institutions where um, secondary school students could come in, be trained for two years as teachers, and then get shipped out to Kuwait, to Saudi Arabia, etc. Um, and that, yeah, so there, there was absolutely a connection between policy and, and education. Thank you. Um... Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean Anderson. Uh, I think I have a question somewhere in my mind, so uh, I apologize in advance if I, uh, if I uh, 
if I am too wordy, perhaps. Uh, what strikes me about this panel, as well as perhaps uh, the first panel of the day, is that we're all, in essence, trying to question or determine what limits are or what boundaries might be. And uh, for me, uh, I'm interested in boundaries as spaces. Uh, and in the case, I think, in all of your cases uh, just now, uh, these limits or these boundaries are processes. So in the case of, of Palest uh, Palestinian camps, those spaces are educational, they're classrooms, and also, like you said uh, quite eloquently, they're about uh, subversion uh, as well. In the case of, of Charles and Lorenzo's project, limits are to be circumscribed. They are, uh, at one hand, geographical, geospatial, and the boat transgresses that boundary and yet is then left to die. And in Eitens' project, uh, human rights, or the question of the right, is, uh, in a way, determined by the limits of the body. But that body is empty. It's uh, like you showed in the, in the artwork. So. Um, I think my question might be a blanket one for all of you, in a way, is to um, perhaps ask, what is a limit? And, and perhaps what the problematics of boundaries are in a world in which we can access any other part of the world, say, via the internet or via Skype, on one hand, and on the other, be witness to uh, troubling images on almost a daily basis uh, in the Mediterranean and elsewhere in the world where we are anticipating this kind of, again, this transgression of boundaries or of limits that are not only self-imposed but uh, imposed by nation states. So I, I don't know if, there, if that's a question necessarily, but uh, I'm, I'm curious what you might think in terms of, say, this how humanitarianism, how a crisis can be spatialized and yet also be located at the body uh, and what that body might be. You can just start. Um, my, my, my response will be uh, short and maybe this is, this is simply what, uh, when I hear limits, um, I can't uh, not think of a wonderful short text uh, by Foucault called uh, Preface to Transgression, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was the, the preface to a, a book by uh, Georges Bataille. And um, in this very short um, early text, I, f I forget the exact date, uh, date he, he argues that limit and transgression are, are simply, you know, the, the other side of the same coin in a sense, right? Um, there is no limit without transgression and no transgression without uh, limit. And limit and transgression also are constantly engaged in a in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle and are constantly transforming um, each other. So uh, that's my, that's what, you know, comes to mind for me when you, when you, uh, evoke the, the idea of limits, and in this sense, maybe to emphasize something that we've um, touched upon briefly, um, again, that the, you know, we rather speak of illegalized migration, for example, right, to underline the state production of uh, illegality through policies of uh, illegalization. And as Lorenzo uh, underlined as well, um, the fact that uh, should there no be policies of uh, illegalization, there would be no limits that migrants would have to transgress through uh, precarious means of, um, of, of transport. I mean, we, we sometimes forget that um, until the end of the 80s, many migrants from various North African uh, countries could still travel to uh, Southern Europe using banal ferries. Um, mm. 
because in relation to personhood, I want to, th I want to think about the limits of personhood in the sense that I want to think about personhood at the border uh, and precisely at those moments, I think we see that this category that we take to be universal in the sense that it is supposed to include all human beings, right? We basically see that it's a historically conditioned uh, category, it's universality, in other words, it's historically conditioned, uh, and as well as it includes a variety of subjects that don't really, that uh, uh, challenge our understanding of the human person, in the sense that we encounter precisely those kinds of subjects that we might call semi-persons or non-persons, in the sense that they do not necessarily have all the rights that we have come to associate with uh, personhood. So it's, I think, thinking about the limit is important in terms of basically seeing uh, the borders or hierarchies or stratifications of what we take to be universal and all-inclusive. Thank you. you want to say um, yeah, I just wanted to say actually what, what I think is striking is about the word limits is how refugees often articulate it themselves. So, you know, when you're talking to them along the journey and they say, you know, like, what is the, the thing that is I, can, I cannot move beyond? There's a fleshness to it. You know, my feet hurt, calluses. Wimp, I, I think we need to gender this conversation a little bit, like sanitation napkins, when they can't, when they have their period. All these moments through the journey where somebody says, that's it, I've had enough. And then what, they, what decisions they make at that point, I think that extraordinary break in, in their conceptualization, in their moment of limitness is also, I, you know, it, it, it comes in very often when I think about the flesh. Yes, Bonnie. Thank you. Um, Atan, I'm just going to think a little bit with your categories. I don't know exactly what my question is. Um, but, well, I'll start with what I think my question is. Um, there's something about photography itself that is accidental. So I'm wondering, if, louder, I'm wondering if we could use Benjamin to think a little bit about the accident of photography, its accidental traits. So um, he, uh, the kind of photography that he was thinking about that produces images of empty streets is long exposure photography. I was just reading an essay by Agamben the other day where he discusses one of the photographs that Benjamin talks about, which is of an empty street, but there is one uh, sort of pair, a human pair in this empty street, uh, a boot black and a client who stopped to have his shoes polished. And, um, and the reason that they appear is because in long exposure photography, anything that's mobile and moving isn't captured by the photograph. But these two stop for a moment to have their uh, commercial encounter. And so they are captured in what otherwise would have been an empty street picture. So that's an, it's an accident of photography, as it were. It's an accident of the technology that you get only empty streets in the images in the early period, that you don't have people in those images. And I'm thinking that somehow, that's why I'm not exactly sure what my question is, this could be a useful trait of the technology for someone who's interested in the disappearance and reappearance of the category of person in a different technological moment right now. Um, and also in the impact on that category of movement. So there's something going on in Benjamin that might be available to you about connections between movement, disappearance, and representation. Um, that's why I, it's not more of a question than that. It's just an, a thought that there's something there for you. I don't know if you agree or not. But that long exposure photography is an accidental trait of the technology, which I think uh, might be rich for you. I will say thank you. Thank you so much for the comment, but I don't know how to respond to it right now, so I'm going to write it down and think about okay. it, that's if fine. that's okay. <laughs> More questions, Can comments? Question? Yeah, sure. So I had a question, actually. Um, so this image of the museum and the refugees, I, it struck me be, uh, because I was thinking of the juxtaposition of this 
to another image, I don't know if you're familiar with it, of the Iraqi national director of, I think, archaeology at the British Museum, looking at a sarcophagus of some sort and covering his mouth in terror or, or in pain, crying. And he's a refugee now in the UK. And I, and I also thought about archival ar archives, and in particular the Ba'ath Party archive in Stanford that was seized by the Kurds, given to Kanaan, whatever. It ended up in, in Stanford. And the Iraqi people demanding its return, and Stanford saying, well, you're not ready to take it. Have it, right? So an, again, a kind of question of retrieval of objects. But here, the, the problem is the refusal to digitize, and also this idea that we cannot give it to you because it, it would potentially de destabilize uh, conditions in Iraq, like determining a kind of future for Iraq based upon a kind of archival hold. So I, I'm just curious as to kind of, yeah, the limits of that, the idea of a universality of objects in that sense and the distribution and what it actually, that there's a politics to, with, to sharing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I think that before the politics of sharing, we have to reconstruct the policies of looting. Right. And uh, because the question now is how to share, or how to reshare, or how to redistribute wealth. But we have to reconstruct what we enjoy in when we go into museums, to reconstruct it as illegally acquired as looted, plundered, and all these uh, terms that we can really accumulate also to describe these uh, really huge waves of migration, forced migration of objects from Africa, from Asia, from Palestine, from all over the world that are, uh, uh, by the way, in most of the places they are showcased as if nothing happened. In Israel, by the way, they are not accessible, what was plundered from Palestinians. Uh, and I think that this is part of what makes Palestine not exceptional, maybe, but uh, symptomatic and a kind of locus of hope that through this some, some claims can uh, affect other places. So uh, I think that all these claims to share, all these claims to restitution, I don't think that should end up in one uh, uh, good claim. There is this very successful, I think, project of Native American, that uh, NAGPRA project, that they uh, arrived to, uh, uh, to define, to formulate uh, in incredibly interesting documents where they arrived, they achieved some agreements with a museum that at least what was uh, looted from uh, 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 symmetries will not be shown. So uh, we have to understand that there are uh, endless procedures that are uh, got kind of aura of professionalism, how to handle objects. These objects that were looted, but were looted as we rescued them. This is not only that the Iraqi people are not ready to acquire the, and to uh, receive now these objects, but they were not ready at the time where it was, these objects were still part of the uh, uh, cultural fabrics. They were not uh, recognized as uh, capable of taking care of. And this is why all these objects went to uh, uh, France, uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, US, England, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, so I think that the polyphony of uh, claims today, how to uh, 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 redistribute this or redistribute access, it's not only, I don't think that we have to, suck, to uh, 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 think again in terminology of uh, the authentic object. This is why I think that Nefertiti is really a, a wonderful process, because it's not about the Nefertiti object to have it back in Egypt, because the, uh, 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 there are so many things that were destroyed when these objects were extracted from cultures and were, uh, when these cultures were deprived of the infrastructure of continuing to produce culture. So I think that uh, the restitution of discrete objects is again problematic and I think that the more uh, structural claims are more interesting and what I'm trying to do in my work to reimagine art uh, from non-imperial perspective is to re-anchor these objects in the discourse of human rights. Because when we speak about human rights, 
uh, 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 there is, of course, the discourse that reduces people to uh, uh, their uh, needs, to the uh, basic uh, rights, etc., etc., etc. And I think that uh, all this discourse uh, uh, reproduces the uh, understanding that people can really be provided with some basic uh, uh, needs while uh, the objects from which they were deprived uh, centuries ago are what they now, what can now be the, uh, the basis out of which they can claim their right to be in reintegrated or integrated in different uh, uh, social fabrics and not necessarily to be repatriated or not necessarily just to have their right to return to an original place. And I think that the, the, the uh, dissemination of objects all around the globe that are coming from different places is a kind of infrastructure that should help us to reimagine differently human rights as uh, living in communities and not only having rights to have rights as Hannah Arendt spoke about, but also as having rights to, uh, uh, to have rights uh, to live with the objects that are part of our cultures. And our cultures not in an authentic way, but our cultures because once upon a time we had certain relation with them. And they meant something else rather than just being objects to be uh, uh, scrutinized and studied critically by uh, another uh, uh, tiny, tiny elite of uh, professionals that know how to interpret objects. Objects had, uh, have different lives, different modes of life. And I think that when we see uh, uh, this kind of project in the Pergamon Museum of uh, hiring some 20 or 30 refugees from Iraq and Iran to uh, serve as guide in the museum, we can see in it uh, really a kind of uh, uh, vicious act, but we can see it more than what the museum is able to do now as a basis to, uh, 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 to think about objects, the looting, the 500 years of looting as uh, an open debt that should uh, allow us to think differently about uh, uh, asylum seekers and right to have a place nearby your object. Sure. Can I um, just wanted to make a quick comment on, on Aitan's presentation because I, I mean it was very inspiring in many respects. Of course there are many, I guess, overlaps with, with our work. And I think one aspect that I found particularly interesting was, uh, you know, this idea that when we start to, uh, um, to look at personhood as a, as a kind of accident, right, then we can also somehow, it's a good place, let's say, um, to look back at a certain discourse, right, which is, I would say, quite prominent in, in, in public discourse, in the media, etc., which would say, you know, um, migrants are, are mistreated because they are treated, you know, as a kind of, as a flow, as a massive flow of people that, you know, they, they, their individuality is not considered, right? And of course, there is, you know, a, a degree of, of truth to that. And, and uh, I mean, that in part has also to do somehow with the kind of technological uh, way in which migration is controlled, especially at sea, right? I mean, if you, uh, you know, if you are on a, on, a, on a border patrol on the sea, a migrant boat starts to appear as a dot, you know, uh, 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 on the ocean, right? And so it's, uh, you know, it's, you have a boatload of migrants, let's say, right? And that the processes of identification starts later. But precisely, this identification, it what, you know, underpins control itself, right? It means, you know, fingerprinting people. It means, you know, uh, giving them an identity is, you know, the, the mean itself through which uh, control is exercised, right? Um, so in that sense, you know, I think, you know, starting from what you are saying, it's, it's also a good uh, point to, to, to criticize this idea and, and to see also, you know, how uh, in fact, this kind of extension of identification, etc., is, is problematic in itself, right? Or can be problematic at least. Um, and maybe just to conclude on, you know, another short anecdote with, with, uh, you know, um, that comes from our research. When we first went uh, to southern Italy in the summer of, of 2011 um, to interview migrants that had just done the crossing. Uh, and to ask them, you know, about the conditions and, and, you know, what they had seen and if there had been, you know, cases of pushbacks or, or deaths at sea, etc. I think one thing that struck both of us uh, was the fact that, you know, many of them came to speak to us as a boat in a sense, right? Or, you know, all the people that were on the same boat, you know, came and gave us a kind of, you know, collective 
narrative, a collective account of, of what had happened, right? So in that sense, you know, it's to, let's say to the, to the boat as a unit co of control also corresponds a kind of, you know, a boat as, as you know, a kind of community in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the process of, of, of you know, uh, becoming together in a sense, right? If you see what I mean. So, uh, should we take more questions? I think that we have time, you can reply, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, there were several other photos I actually thought of uh, when I was thinking about this workshop, and uh, one of them, I can't remember the photographer, but he works with the UNHCR now, he's a war zone photographer, but... If you uh, can speak to the mic. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, he wrote this piece in The Guardian uh, with uh, some of his photographs that basically were showing people just coming out of the boats and it was ending with um, a quotation from um, one of the people on the boats and that was the only thing actually, only statement that, uh, that was included from a migrant but it basically said, uh, could you, can you just not see that we are touch me, can you not uh, feel that I'm a human being? And it was that kind of basically um, idea that we will immediately recognize the human once we see one that basically gave rise to um, my interest in uh, Larson's uh, work. Uh, this idea that, yes, we will immediately recognize the human once we see one and treat it accordingly with its inherent dignity. That's precisely the assumption. And, and I think what is happening right now, there are, yes, different ways of seeing, representing, and, and one of them is basically this kind of visual technology that is now using on behalf of, that is being used on behalf of border technology. And as a boat becomes a dot on a huge map and, and uh, Maybe that relates to Bonnie's question about how these new technologies can give rise to new accidents for personhood in the sense that it becomes impossible to actually recognize that even as a boat, right? Uh, it becomes difficult to establish that this is a boat. Your work is interesting in that regard, but also that there, this is a boat with people and there are human beings there and it becomes difficult. They, they seem to escape us in certain ways with these new technologies too. Well, um, yes, uh, I had uh, so. Yeah, I had a question for Lorenzo. But if you can take the mic, please, because we won't hear you. Ah, um, she has you. So I had a question for. Sorry. I had a question for Lorenzo and Charles about well, and also maybe um, taking up on the previous question about limits and borders. Um, so you're looking also at what defines the human in the space of the Mediterranean. I, I, it was just, is, is, your is your project partly about legal innovation in terms of um, what happens to the, are, do, do the people that you interviewed, do they identify as migrants or refugees? And I'm, I myself, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, I have no idea of the difference. Um, is, that, is that a distinction that they make? Um, or that they, they would claim, or is that something that is placed upon them? And then a really ignorant question just about maritime rescue. I thought that that was, I mean, me as a layman, I just thought that a boat, you know, a ship is required, a vessel is required to assist another vessel in distress, but clearly that wasn't the case of the example that you've been speaking about. And what is the, the figure of the human in that border space, which clearly is the Mediterranean? Thank you. If I can just piggyback on this question and ask you, Lorenzo and Charles, you presented your work as an academic paper, but it has also kind of uh, implications in the real world. If you can say something about uh, how did you work with it vis-a-vis uh, -vis international organizations. It, I think it will be complementary to what you ask. I hope so. Should yeah. we? Sure. Um, Maybe to start with the uh, yeah what you were saying, Ariella, and, and what's what's connected also to to what you were saying about the legal innovation. I mean, indeed, uh, this work was um, carried out and 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 uh, uh, thought, let's say, from the beginning in conjunction 
um, with a coalition of NGOs that had started to demand accountability you know, for, for the massive deaths of migrants at sea in the summer of 2011. And uh, um, you know, the argument there was precisely that, uh, something we didn't mention in detail, but this was the time uh, of the NATO intervention in Libya 2011, right? So there were, uh, you know, tens of military ships that were deployed off the coast of Libya tasked precisely with controlling, you know, whoever was going in and out of the country uh, by boat, right? So the, the claim of these NGOs basically was that, you know, given the, 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 the technological means that were deployed, they could not, the militaries could have not, not have seen, you know, the many people who were dying at sea, right? And, and for that reason, precisely, they were, uh, you know, um, they could be accused of non-assistance of people in distress at sea, which, as you say, is, 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 uh, is a crime, right, in international maritime law. Um, so what we produce, I mean, the, 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 the images and, and you know, the, the work that you have seen basically comes from a report that we produced together with these NGOs, and that then became the legal basis um, uh, so the basis for, for a series of legal cases that were, uh, you know, initiated in various European and, and international courts uh, and that they are still undergoing uh, precisely for the crime of non-assistance of people at sea. Um, of course, I mean, uh, let's say that our aim as well as that of the NGOs was somehow to address the kind of larger, I would say, structural violence of the EU border regime. Uh, but of course, we had to translate that claim into a legal context, which meant, you know, going uh, against, you know, people involved in a particular case, right? Uh, of course, I mean, this one case, the Left to Die boat, was, was uh, you know, um, being particularly, let's say, heinous and, 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 uh, and, and tragic and, and, you know, having also have received quite a lot of media coverage was, you know, instrumental to that, uh, to that process. Um, you want to, yeah? Mike. As the space of the boat, as the space that has a similar or analogous to a refugee. Maybe, I'm not sure. I mean, it's, uh, the boat definitely becomes many things, right? Uh, you know, at the moment in which you start the crossing, uh, you know, it's basically caught up in a series of, of, of very different legal regimes, right, which are not very clearly defined. You know, the very distinction between migrants and refugees that you were pointing at, I mean, uh, it has legally, let's say, quite tenuous basis. Of course, you know, if you ask a legal scholar, well, it will tell you very simply, you know, the refugee is somebody who, you know, uh, defined by uh, the Convention of Human Rights, uh, so somebody who flees war, etc., etc. So, you know, there is a definition of refugees, right? And migrants usually is, is a term uh, used more generally, let's say, to define anyone who is moving, uh, and, and recently has also, you know, become increasingly used for, for to define econo so-called economic migrants, right? So people who, according to international law, uh, do not rightfully, uh, you know, leave their country, but they, they do so only to, to seek better economic opportunities in a sense, right? Uh, but certainly, as I was saying, you know, the boat starts its travel and is caught up in this, in this multiplication of legal regimes. Uh, and, and in a sense, I think part of our work is also to say that this is not, let's say, a malfunction of international law, but rather, you know, one of the way in which it structurally produces some of its effects, right? And and uh, and in which, like, this boat really becomes a kind of contested site, right? So I don't know if it's a it's a refugee site, but certainly it becomes a kind of forum for for uh, for certain politics to to happen or or not happen, perhaps. Yeah, short one. Yeah. Um, I mean, as. Um as Lorenzo was uh, mentioning uh, before, um, at sea, somehow, the unit of control is the boat, right? The process at sea, the unit of control is the, the boat. So the process of properly biopolitical control really starts from the moment migrants uh, set foot on firm land. That's the moment when their bodies start being counted as they disembark, their fingerprints start being taken, etc. Um, but this changed temporarily during um, Mare Nostrum, where 
so the Italian um, military humanitarian operation that lasted between October 2013 and 2014, during which there were large military ships deployed very close to the Libyan um, shores, which were intercepting migrants as they uh, arrived. In these cases, um, those large ships became, in effect, floating detention centers in which the biopolitical process of identification and control was beginning on board those ships um, themselves. But I just would like to come back on, on two uh, questions. I mean, one is migrant refugees, uh, a debate which has been incredibly uh, prominent as well in the, the mainstream media over the last um, year. And uh, certainly, uh, I mean, within, within debates and also migrant struggles, um, for a long time I would say that the, the progressive stance has usually been to refuse the, the, the assignment uh, of refugees as a kind of predetermined category uh, that would be distinct and supposedly more legitimate um, than migrants, right? Which are then supposed to be sorted out, right, as bogus economic migrants and, uh, you know, soon to be uh, deported, right? So the demand has rather been um, within, I would say, more progressive uh, positions um, to demand rights for migrants to cool. Um, however, uh, things are a bit more complicated, I would say, uh, these days when, you know, we're really facing uh, the, the most, the biggest uh, uh, exodus of politically persecuted uh, people since the, the Second World War. Now, personally, rather than you know choosing either or, generally we we still refer to migrants uh, generically. I would rather want to uh, question the way those very categories um, came into existence. And um, in this sense, I, I find really crucial the historical framing and the long durée um, that um, Ariella proposes as well, uh, where you denaturalize both categories, right? Which um, both, in fact, presuppose the existence of states, which, you know, in the long durée is only a, a relatively recent uh, phenomena, right? Um, but maybe just to come back to the other question, Innovation, um, I think that the, this case demanded a number of um, legal innovations, which were not, I would say, you know, the, the product of our own work, but a, a legal team that uh, assembled um, around the, the case, because um, the case poses a number of legal difficulties on which actually Itamar uh, has also uh, been, been writing. First of all, it's a form of violence which is exercised without touching. Secondly, it's a form of violence which is exercised by many actors at once. Third, it's a form of violence which is exercised in the in-between space of the sea where the question of jurisdiction, um, as you were saying, um, becomes uh, crucial. Finally, and also it was exercised by states that were partly under the command of NATO, which has um, immunity within uh, international law. So I, I wouldn't want to go here in, in detail into the, the legal strategies that were, that were used, but I think it's really a case that uh, forced lawyers and legal experts to, in many ways, to go beyond the, co the conventional boundaries of their, of their own discipline and uh, practice. Um, but beyond that, I think that our aim has been um, basically to politicize the sea. Um, I, um, to come back to, to Sean's question, um, the limit of the sea is a, is a, is a thick, and large space, right? Which, which is usually only thought as the in-between space of flow and passage, right? But here what we've been trying to do is, on the one hand, um, analyze the, the political geography 
of the sea. And on the other hand, uh, targets the sea for a space of politics in its own right, either through um, strategic litigation, but also through Watch the Med and the project that emerged from this, um, which is called the, the Alarm Phone, in which activists located on both sides of um, the sea have used some of the tools of geospatial mapping that we began, began to create um, to support migrants in distress um, while they are at sea and force states to comply with their obligation to um, operate uh, rescue swiftly. So the, the tools that we started to develop um, have become tools to yeah, uh, con contest the deadly border regime at sea in many different ways. Thank you. We have 15 minutes, so we are moving to what Bonnie called the accelerated uh, phase of our uh, panel. So we will just uh, take a few questions. Yeah. Uh, this is. Um, I have Itamar, Tom, Adi, Amanda. Yeah. Okay. Five questions. This is on a previous thread of the conversation concerning uh, your paper, Ariella. This mind. is on a previous thread of the conversation concerning your paper, Ariella. Uh, so I was wondering, and this may not be something that you can say about uh, anything about at this point, but I'm wondering what is the relationship between what you're discussing and describing and the recent kind of turn to a discourse of saving architectural treasures in uh, Middle Eastern and West, uh, West African countries. I'm thinking of uh, you know, the destruction of uh, remains by ISIS and the fact that the International Criminal Court has recently decided to launch an investigation with regarding to Timbuktu in Mali um, in order to kind of prosecute uh, whoever might be uh, responsible for uh, the destruction of those of, of, of uh, cultural heritage in Timbuktu, Timbuktu based on the fact that this uh, is a war crime. So I'm one, and this is a very, you know, the politics around this have been debated, they're, they're con controversial, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, I just have two quick thoughts um, on Aiton's example of the, um, of the person who asks for verification of their human identity um, coming off the ship. I'm not sure that that uh, implies some notion of immediate recognition. It seems like it might go exactly in the opposite way um, and uh, be a request for um, kind of a counter signature. Like, I know I'm human, um, but obviously you can't see that I am, so won't you make some effort to uh, countersign uh, this. So it feels more like an evidentiary plea than a, taken, than a notion of it's obvious who I am. Anyway, simple question for you two guys. I've heard you talk about this project many times, but I've never heard you discuss photographs taken by migrants on the ships. So either you've been keeping this secret <laughs> or... I support them. Uh, <laughs> I never saw it either. Or you've developed some new information. Um, so I just compress my question really simply, and I don't mean this um, flippantly, but based on your research, why is that happening? Why are migrants taking photographs on these ships? Well, I think my question has already been partly answered and was anticipated by um, Ariella when she asked for more explicit discussion of the real world implications of uh, your project in forensic oceanography. But I will just say that it seems to me that um, simply the naming of it as forensic oceanography is significant. It's, a, it's already a kind of significant claim um, to be entering into a certain kind of field that involves the legal, the scientific, um, the legal and the scientific. I guess I would say, and I know there's a, a, a body of work in uh, forensic humanitarianism that extends beyond uh, your own project, but I, I'm struck by simply the name of it as a strong claim, and, 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 and what I was thinking before Ali, Ariella asked her question um, was how striking it was that your, your paper ended on a kind of uh, a problematic, which is to say, 
a hesitancy about reproducing the very forms of power that you're trying to intervene upon. And I, this is more of just a comment, but why that would be the telos of a paper. Is it venue specific? Is it context specific? Do you speak differently elsewhere in different spheres? Because you know, there's a way in which a number of the papers end on a question. And of course, <laughs> the, the, the title of the conference invites you to end on a question. But I'm just struck by that. This, and, and, and what I would see is a certain kind of, I want to say, normative hesitancy in that moment. But it's also kind of a field condition, which is to say, this is sort of what we do. Um, and it's both, politic, it's both motivated by political anxiety, I would say, but also a kind of investment in uncertainty and undecidability. So that's sort of more of a comment, but I also see it in the human accident, uh, the person, in the person project. Um, and I would just contrast it a little bit, and I'm not trying to you know, say anything absolute here, but um, to Ariella's more kind of strong claim for new citizenship, which is a more kind of reconstructed norm. And you're talking more about political tactics, as far as I understand you, and a kind of genealogical stringency on the question of, right, I mean, when you talked about refugee migrant. Um, so anyway, it's sort of half comment, half question. Abby, you're up, Ted. Thank you. A question for Mesna. I wonder if you would elaborate on the uh, miserable failure of Sands of Sorrow to raise funds or acquire an audience, and also the chilling effect it had on the journalist's career. Those were the questions, right? Ah, yeah, Peter. Um, I, I think I might be repeating a bit, but for Charles and Lorenzo, uh, this is sort of the same question I had for A.L. Wiseman when he came a few months ago, which is, I'm curious as to the, 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 the status of, of your strategy of taking up international law as your sort of chosen political strategy. Um, specifically, what's the sort of movement or you know, uh, dialogue you see between um, the particular focus of, of cases and the more structural problem? And the reason I bring that up is because with something like forensic oceanography, forensic architecture, whatever it may be, um, how do you see uh, if, if we're aware of the structural issue, why do we need then the, the sort of proving of these specific things? Why do we need to know that the NATO ships ignored? We know via NATO's very existence sort of, um, but in any case, um, sort of, I guess I'll stop there because the rest has been asked. So this speaks to uh, some of the same uh, legal question, I think. I had, uh, I had thought that the idea of, of migrant, uh, uh, a, a migrant uh, consideration as per refugee had long been established and that that actually was a viable legal uh, uh, definition. I remember the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 seemed to establish what a refugee was. The Refugee Convention of 1951 reiterated that's, of course, after World War II and the big push to come to understand the refugee status. And then the European Convention on Human Rights in 1953. It seems that on a, that, that case by case decisions about who is a migrant and who is a refugee are bound to be arbitrary now. Uh, that Afghans, Libyans, Somalis will also claim that they are fleeing violent death and it may prove impossible to send them back. The Refugee Convention regime of 1951 is no longer adequate, but it seems that the legal basis of the separation between refugee status and migrant status is pretty, is pretty clear. I mean, it was, it was they don't just have a well-founded fear of persecution. It was now they're effectively fleeing violent death. Thank you. Sorry. So that they're now actually, actually actively fleeing violent death before the question was a much more simpler one. I mean, if, if they were just being persecuted, then, then they, were, they were here and, uh, and their status was refugee status. Now, 
now it's much more complicated, not because there's just so many of them, as per the Syrians, but also because the separation of that classification where Afghans, Libyans, and Somalis, they're attempting to return them, that's been terribly unsuccessful. Even if they've isolated that, the number is less than 40% that they've succeeded in, in actually being able to work out as per the EU. But it does seem that the legal uh, question of migrant status as opposed to refugee status is, is there. I, doesn't that seem to be true from a legal perspective? Thank you. So I think we will take each of us two or three minutes and we will end a little bit late. It means that uh, the next panel that Lynn is chairing will start five minutes late, so we'll still have 10 minutes break. So just very quickly, Itamar, uh, in relation to your question, I think that when uh, historically, when we speak about historical heritage, this was the term that uh, was the umbrella under which the big lootings of Africa, Asia, India, whatever, uh, was conducted. So, uh, speaking about um, um, cultural heritage, we have first of all to question uh, this uh, policy that focused on objects and was uh, authorized by these uh, rare objects that they it had to rescue, authorized to destroy fabrics of life all over. So when uh, there is a new campaign against uh, to rescue objects that ISIS is uh, uh, threatening to, uh, to destroy, I think that we have first of all to foreground fabrics of life rather than objects and to recontextualize it. And I think that what is really important in relation to what Amanda said, you know, this uh, in between the question mark and the exclamation mark, I think that this is a matter of fact that uh, millions of objects are all over the world and the question is how we relate to them, not as precious objects to be uh, just uh, 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 interpreted and uh, displayed to audience, but as the one of the layers out of which a new polity can be imagined. Um, yes, so just yeah, really quickly. Part of there's two two separate sides to this. First is that to the mic. Oh yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, so Dorothy Thompson was very heavily involved in reporting on the Second World War, and was influential in the sense that she was reporting on she was anti-Nazi journalist who was reporting on Nazi activities and you know reported also on the Holocaust. This her coverage of this, you know, her introduction to it was a result of a visit, a delegation visit that she did to the region and comes back and says, listen, there are refugees here. We have to deal with this question. Now, in terms of why it was, you know, she gets blacklisted, there, I mean, it's, it's a long story. It's kind of well documented, but centrally what happened is that the, you know, there was a lot of heavy pressure on these film houses from various sectors in the U.S not to film this, not to screen this. So there's that, that, that part of the failure was, I mean, nobody saw this film. I think what's more interesting is how this film has had an afterlife since then, where it's become an artifact of Palestinian refugees as an actual one of the first moving images that fourth generation Palestinians see their grandparents or their great grandparents in this film. And that afterlife is also now being documented in various um, places. So it's it's in it's in you know it's it's had an iteration of many forms. Um, from the other side as well, it's that the declaration of Palestinians as refugees was not normative. It wasn't. It, there was a contested battle, and so the Arab Arab League offices in New York and in D.C. also were unhappy with this film because it declared Palestinians refugees. Um, so they were not, they didn't support its din dissemination either. And just to address uh, Tom's question very briefly, so basically the statement that's quoted from the migrant, if I remember correctly, is touch me, am I not a human? And I think you're right, it can be read in a different way, that it might be an evidentiary plea instead of just one basically that's saying that, look, uh, just demand for immediate recognition. I agree with that. But for me, what was interesting in that, how it was received or how it was interpreted within this, within the context of that Guardian article, right? And basically, it was coming immediately. It was, it was first the only statement that we hear from the market, too. 
uh, it, it was Im uh, immediately following this discussion that, look, we might have disagreements about whether they are migrants or refugees, but at least we might agree on this one thing, that they are human beings. And what I'm trying to do is basically that actually we don't have a consensus either about what it means to recognize someone as a human being or what that kind of recognition would entail or require. Is it just simply a minimal recognition in the sense of, you know, biological needs and basically just throwing down sandwiches, you know, as we saw in those images, or does it require more than that? And then how does that relate to personhood? So I think it basically gives rise to a controversy and dispute where people actually see that, no, it's just obvious. They are human beings. Um, on the question, maybe to start with, on the question of the naming, right? Um, clearly, I mean, I think the, you know, naming this project Forensic Oceanography is also a kind of part of the tactical move to try to somehow enter a specific space that, that you were describing, right? A space of, of law and science, etc. And I guess this move, I mean, was not probably entirely our choice, but was kind of determined by a certain shift that has, you know, that, that we have registered, let's say, in, uh, you know, investigation about uh, human rights and, and crimes against humanity, where basically, you know, forensic science has come to occupy uh, a very prominent space, right? And, and this space has been, so far, I would say, largely occupied by, you know, the, the, what, what they all would call the, the tyranny of the truth of, of states and, and corporations, right? Uh, basically, you know, it has become, or, or it has been traditionally, in fact, since, since many years, uh, like, you know, the, the, the techniques by which states police individuals uh, and, and by which, you know, they claim a certain scientific superiority that allows them to silence the victims of that violence, right? So. We wanted to contest that, but at the same time, I guess, you know, uh, we didn't want that critique to happen only at a kind of, you know, theoretical level, but really enter the very space uh, and, and enter a kind of, you know, bodily struggle almost with, with, those, with those claims, in a sense, right? And in order to do that, well, you have to, 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 uh, to make a certain claims that I would say put us in a kind of schizophrenic position where, you know, we, we, we argue for a certain, the truthfulness of a certain kind of, you know, scientific reconstructions, and then, you know, like the following day we write a paper about, you know, how this is all like just, you know, a narrative that is constructed, etc. right? Um, on the other question, which is somehow I see connected, you know, uh, why do we need like these specific cases if we know about the structural violence? Um, I guess there my reply would be, uh, in the sense that, that uh, you know, I think there's also, uh, there's almost a kind of paralyzing effect, I think, in, you know, in thinking about this violence as structural, in the sense, you know, as something which, which escapes representation, which is just, you know, out there, uh, and, and we cannot, you know, visualize, we cannot grasp, we, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it escapes any attempt to, to pin it down, right? Um, of course, that is partly true, and, and this is what we argue as well, but uh, so the next question would be, so what do we do, right? I mean, we can either, let's say, sit, uh, you know, in the university and, and continuously propose a kind of, you know, critique of that, uh, which, of course, it's, it's not only, uh, you know, um, it's, it's necessary, right? Uh, but on the other end, I think it's also, I mean, our attempt, in a sense, was and is to also try to go beyond that, right? And in order to do that, well, you have to, to, to position yourself, as we said, tactically, right? And, and to try to find ways in which you can somehow, you know, insert, let's say, grain of sense into these this, this larger mechanisms, right? Of course, you know, we're very well aware that this not, you know, even if the people that, that have uh, uh, not rescued the, 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 the migrants on the left to die boat would be found, you know, this is not going to kind of radically change the, the violence of the border regime, and yet I think it would, you know, as the EFC and, and JAMA case, you know, it did 
produce effects, right? Which, you know, were progressive, I would say, to a certain extent, and, and somehow forced, like, uh, you know, this structural violence to, to manifest itself in different ways. I mean, it doesn't completely eliminate it, but, but it's a kind of end-to-end -end struggle with that, I would say. And, and in order to do that, you need some kind of tactics that, that uh, in this present kind of legal discourse, are articulated through uh, specific legal, individual legal cases. Very briefly. Um, so v very briefly to, to add a few words and respond to the still open questions, I just want to uh, contribute as well to this question of um, our own kind of self-critique at the end of the presentation. And I liked a lot your uh, description as this is part of our field condition. And I think this is absolutely correct in the sense that um, operating in the field, we're, we're operating in an imminent field. I, we are seizing the tools of our enemies, if you will, trying to redirect them to another use. But certainly, our enemies are also seizing our own tools and the, the images and discourses that we, that we produce. So this is a hand-to-hand -hand struggle, again, which demands um, constant um, repositioning, and I think crucial for us as a, as a compass, if you will, um, is, is, we could say, the rule of the axiom of the disobedient gaze, which is, you know, uh, do not seek to show what the state is already spectacularizing, but show what the state is seeking to keep uh, hidden at all costs. So states may be used to keep hidden at all costs deaths, now they're they're spectacularizing as well, uh, those deaths, but what they're hiding is their own responsibility in the production um, of those deaths, and that's what we, uh, as a result, need to um, for, foreground. Um, the mobile phone images, uh, I think, you know, this is, this is interesting also because essentially there, there are two reasons why we didn't or only fleetingly mention them in our, in our reports before. First, because there's no evidence. Those, those images don't exist. And in that sense, they have a very limited role to play in a report that is geared at reproducing uh, an account of events. But secondly, I would say because this whole uh, encounter between photographers partly resisted our own interpretation. Um, I mean, simply, uh, they they, the, 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 the survivors explained to us that, at least at the beginning of their journey, you know, they're, they're photographing at the beginning the best time of their lives. They think, you know, they're gonna make it, right? This is, this is fabulous, I'm, I'm going to a, a new life, right? And uh, there, there are many mobile phone videos which uh, circulate uh, today online, etc. cetera. Um, subsequently, they continued to photograph those events for, for different reasons, which I think they did then highly, in particular, never entirely um, explicited to, to us. And in that sense, uh, academic contexts and uh, contexts where uh, theoretical questions about image production as well are foregrounded instead of human rights and uh, factual ones are also spaces that we need to think some of the dimensions of the events that resist uh, simple factual reconstruction. And then I think the last question, that uh, I, I can only answer too, too briefly is the question again of the, the refugee migrant uh, distinction. Certainly, we 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 are um, we certainly are for defending uh, the rights of refugees. Right, refugee. Uh, the Geneva Convention is one of the tools that we have to defend the rights of people on the move. Right, but we also have to be weary of the way those categorizations become a tool within a regime of sorting and a justification to exercise violence on those who do not fit those neat legal categories. And maybe I would suggest that we need to, um, as, um, we need to focus at least as much um, on the violence that uh, states of the global north are, are perpetuating onto um, populations of the global south uh, as we do need to focus on uh, the conditions of violence that they're fleeing um, initially.
Thank you. Thank you for the participants. We are going to start the next panel at 4.10 and we'll end it with 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes late. So we'll start 4.10, we'll end 6.10. Thank you.